Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. I am privileged to welcome back writer, executive producer, director Robert C. Cooper to Dial the Gate for a uh, another installment of Stargate uh, SG-1's retrospective. We're going back and looking at a specific series of episodes, specifically seasons three and four from SG-1 with Robert. But before we get started, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube algorithm and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. Hasn't happened a lot, but occasionally does. And clips from this episode will be released uh, over the course of the next uh, few uh, days and weeks on the GateWorld.net YouTube channel. Although this episode is being presented uh, live, it was not recorded live. So Robert and I got together uh, in the middle of the week to record this episode to air later. So the moderators will not be taking uh, questions from this particular episode. But the next time that we have him on, I will be inviting fans to submit questions to him. The previous episode that we had him on was nothing but fan questions. So that really worked out that way. But next, the next episode will be a combination of both. This particular episode is going to focus on season three and four of SG-1. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in Robert C. Cooper. Robert C. Cooper, executive producer, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, Stargate Universe. Thank you so much, sir, for coming back on. I'm always pinching myself when I get to sit down and talk with you because it's like, you know, there are, there are certain people who are considered like, like uh, at the center of this whole thing that you guys grew for so many seasons of television over these these number of years i'm really really thankful to have you rob well, it's a pleasure it's always fun talking to you i had a question before we get into uh the outline of, of some of these episodes about area 51 and your relationship with the u.s air force uh the air force of course uh endorsed the series uh jonathan glassner told us they they took their name name quote unquote off a couple of episodes that that leaned into uh some jack and sam heavy stuff that they weren't necessarily comfortable with uh earlier on in his tenure did the air force ever give you pushback for area 51 i don't remember them ever specifically saying don't mention this don't mention that the truth of the matter is they always were kind of coy and slightly amused by that stuff you know like the the like you know the story i mean you probably know this story i mean the fans have probably heard it but you know there, i remember martin wood telling me that one time when he went down to shoot uh exteriors at cheyenne mountain that they took him on a tour and then there was this closet door that had the you know the, the sign on it that said stargate and um <laughs> You know, I think whatever, as long as, as long as, as it didn't, um, you know, undermine the seriousness of the work that they did and, and who they were as an org, obviously as a, as a, an organization, they, they were, um, they were fine with us kind of building a mystique and, and, uh, hmm. and a fun about their, uh, uh, you know the way they did business and it was like you know it was stargate was kind of a recruitment tool for them absolutely you know and it's mentioned in the show uh if some of this stuff were to exist plausible deniability you know yeah. so it's some. in fact some people think that wormhole extreme is a show within a show within a show yeah <laughs> okay uh you lost me at the third one but uh the, <laughs> okay fair the most i think we the most pushback we ever got i mean the, the one i think john is probably uh, referring to was in um uh you know the one where where the alternate reality uh story there but for the grace of god where where uh o'neill and carter kiss and you know that was a that was a big pushback 
you know, we kind of laughed and we're like, it's an alternate reality. And we're like, yeah, but you're still using our uniforms in that alternate reality. It always comes uh, down to uniforms and stuff. And so well, she's not in one, you know, she's not even so military in that. That was the solution. And right. that, that was a change we made to accommodate the notes. So we're like, okay, so what if she's not military in the, in the alternate reality? And they're like, nah, can't, can't really say anything about that anymore. Then. <laughs> there we go. How many hands uh, were involved in a, uh, in a script in terms of notes? So in the, in the um, showtime the years, how many? Or total? Oh, you mean overall? Oh, my God lots okay uh yeah so you'd have the studio mgm whoever whoever was handling notes for them uh you'd have the network uh, whichever it was whether it be showtime or um uh all sci-fi eventually um but then you had yeah you had some stuff from the military and then you know we had internal notes internal, too you know? of course you notes from from richard dean anderson and michael greenberg who's his producing partner and uh um yeah so there was there was always a, there was always a lot of notes there was a question about uh the air force and this is another um like how do i want to put it uh, uh urban legend stargate legend that i'm surprised i've never asked you and it had it, it went back to area 51 um that uh, later on in the series an air force patch appeared on the uniform can do you remember what spurred finally adding that to the uniform no no do you remember when it was sorry okay the sg1 wing badge season seven I've only noticed it in the episode today, season seven, episode five. So hmm. by the time it went over to uh, uh, Sci-Fi Channel is is when you guys added it. Hmm. Is that a costume question? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't remember specifically there being uh, a decision around that or why why it necessarily happened. It may have been just a someone changed changing of the guard at the air force and someone saying why don't you do this but i don't know i don't remember i don't recall okay and i'll i'll, I'll just preface uh, this conversation once again with my disclaimer for for yourself and the fans that um if if no one's counting uh uh stargate is uh 25 years old uh, mm -hmm. this year sg1 uh, yeah a big celebration uh, certainly, yes, the series, not the movie, was a bit older. And um, yeah, my memory doesn't always isn't always so effective going back that far. Uh, uh, you know, so I will do my best, but uh, please, please forgive me. And you know, the devote fans will will look go. He doesn't even care about Stargate. He doesn't. Oh, you remember. know what? They can they can go fly a kite. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've managed to pull out uh, an a, a surprising amount of detail. Over, yeah, well, over the course of this series, so thank you. Right. Fair Game. Yes, Take, I can. Season three. So Fair Game is one of my favorite episodes because it introduces uh, three of of uh, the gold villains from the show, you, Nearty, and Cronus. Uh, and this was an episode that aired in 1999, and it establishes a protected planets treaty Earth being added to the Protected Planets Treaty in uh, this episode, which I thought was kind of interesting because we've already been attacked by Apophis, um, attacked by basically Hathor. There, there have been a couple of other situations where they've come after us. But the, the System Lords as a collective are at some point here setting their eye on us. And you guys make a, a turn in the story to basically say... The Asgard's going to intercede, and they're not going to come after us directly anymore. Which I thought was interesting from a from a story perspective, because you're basically more or less putting a halt to one of the major dangers, should the gold be believed to be abiding by this treaty, and moving in other directions. I was I was curious as to as to uh, your decision to make that happen. Well. We've talked about this before, uh, David, is that, you know, a lot of times what happens in the show is you create villains who are so powerful mm. that you don't understand why, A, you know, the, they don't win, 
uh, immediately or why they, you know, in the case of the Asgard, for example, super powerful, why don't they just destroy the ghoul? So um, we needed some sort of kind of rationale, some sort of, you know, breaks put on the the power and and you know i thought well let's look at how do how do superpowers on on earth uh navigate that world right mm-hmm. how do they um and how do countries who don't have nuclear capabilities you know uh protect themselves and uh it's it was just really how do we how do we mitigate the fact that we were so undermatched both on both sides with with you know the gould and the asgard that we needed to kind of put the brakes on world war for a beat mm-hmm. uh and 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 get back to sort of a, a, a kind of equilibrium where we could be going out and having weekly adventures through the Stargate, as opposed to dealing with, you know, the next Gould invasion. Yeah. Earth's going to blow up again. You know, there's more than just Earth's going to blow up. Right. We had to, you know, we kind of, you know, we kind of went too far in a way. I mean, you know, you, you could, you could argue that it was fun while we, while we were doing it, but, (laughs) um, but yeah, you know, you kind of, you, you needed to sort of find a way beyond us gaining power and defeating the Gould outright uh, to to kind of give us a, a beat to be able to go through that process of, of learning and getting out there and, and kind of building our experience and gaining knowledge and power slowly as opposed to instantly, you know. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the, the things you that happens when you're kind of running fast as you as you uh develop a series in its early days you maybe make some some mistakes uh at the same time you want to do cool things that that interest people uh so you do them and then you kind of go afterwards uh yeah maybe we uh maybe we shouldn't have quite given those people that much power uh what do we do about that so there are a lot of episodes in the series over the years where we were like trying to undercut some of the the bigger you know things we had done and and just like whoa let's just pull back and 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 make make sure those guys we kind of address the idea of why uh why those guys just haven't come and destroyed us just absolutely wiped us out no and it led to also i mean look there's another there's another thing too which is that um the reality of making television which is when you do these big episodes you need some small ones and we always went into every season with you know what are going to be our kind of smaller shows you know shows that don't have aren't full of explosions and frankly i think there's a lot of fans who enjoy those those kind of more socio-political uh shows and you know there's still kind of fun uh you know, Easter egg character moments and, and, and things that keep you intrigued. Um, but I think, you know, the tension from uh, peace talks, essentially, with, with a, an enemy as, as uh, devious and untrustworthy as the Gould w- is cool, you know? So, so it kind of was one of those um, uh, questions of, guess what, we're going to host the three gould on earth uh for peace talks like that that was a cool cheap one in a way uh (laughs) yeah yeah follow up some some big uh openers because you know whenever we would do our openers we we'd kind of make a big splash and and we you know you you you'd go way over budget and you needed to do something to to pull pull it back a little bit to make you know convince the studio you you weren't going to go crazy and it's also your first men- mention in this episode of replicators uh, of the threat, I should say, right. um, because you're you're laying the groundwork at least for an explanation as to why they're not they're not riding in to our rescue every time we have a problem. They have their own issues to deal with, and right. yeah, and it was always about rationalizing and understanding 
the logic behind why such super godlike beings weren't behaving godlike. <laughs> right. Exactly. And th is this at this point were the Asgard working for you guys? This is an episode that that features the puppet very heavily. Um uh, were, were you thinking at this point uh, along the line and with this episode is in production that you were going to bring them back for the end of the season? Or was this episode kind of a litmus test for those ideas, seeing if people were going to buy the Jim Henson side of, you know, of of effects? I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember what the fan sort of temperature was on, on Thor uh, at that time particular time but i know we had had him in the show enough that if there had been some sort of giant uproar or backlash about it people would have i think reacted so i don't remember i don't remember like i don't remember if thor had his own fan page at that point but <laughs> but uh but i don't remember getting like you know skewered for it either so i i uh i think we were i think we were thinking he was going to be a going to be a series regular at that point. Well, here's the thing. Rick was having a blast with him from the beginning. Yeah. You know, Rick is, is will say to this day that he's he's his favorite guest star. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you've got you've got your lead and co-executive producer being in love with this thing, then, you know, something is working. At least yeah, at least the comedy about angle that, is. I mean, his 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 enthusiasm for Thor uh, and and the puppet frankly was was always a bit of a certainly a shock to me when I first found out because I didn't think he was going to like it at all. Um, but the ongoing uh, romance between uh, Richard Dean Anderson and the puppet was uh, <laughs> was a source of great uh, pleasure. Oh, it was definitely a bromance, absolutely. Um, Dead Man Switch. So this is an episode that is close to uh, many a fan's uh, heart. It is. It goes a little bit back to that perspective of, uh, I guess it wouldn't be considered a small show because it's not featured so heavily on the base. Um, and it's a lot of forest wandering, which I think you guys did pretty effectively uh, throughout the series. Uh, what? Forests in Stargate? I know, right? <laughs> There's always trees in this galaxy. Um, and I, I love in, um, uh, there was an episode in, in, I can't remember which, which episode it was that, f that features an explanation, oxygen bearing life, you know, you're going to have trees. So it was, it was a good, it was a good, uh, acknowledgement of that. Uh, but you have a guest performance in this episode in the form of Sam J. Jones, uh, better known as, uh, Flash Gordon. And this was, uh, Stargate's attempt and I think success at uh, one of its first wild card characters, a right. bounty hunter, and you don't know which way he was going to go. Tell us a little bit about uh, Dead Man Switch. Well, you know, I don't think it's any secret that I loved Star Wars and that I and that I grew up on the you know original movies, and yeah. uh, you know, I I I pretty much. I think I walked in the room and said, you know, I wanted to create like a Han Solo type character who who could be kind of a, like you said, a wild card who who uh, we could interact with and and kind of not know what he whose side he was on and we could use for kind of information and and just fun. Like I wanted to write to write someone who was like that kind of. 80s 90s movie uh one-liner you know fast talking rogue uh uh guy and um conceptually uh originally i was really excited about the whole thing um it uh uh and you know i i mean fans seem to to enjoy the episode so very much so he, he got his own uh comic book when did that Stargate comic come out here? Let me have a look here. Stargate SG-1, Eris Bach. This was uh, a 2004 issue. Non-enhanced regular... Oh, that's just the specs on the on the comic. But um, 
yeah, this this character is is still brought up uh, uh, to this day. And fans are like, you know, why didn't we ever see him again? Is, is Was it just a, a story issue? Were, were there just things um, that went you on know, behind the scenes that were just, you know, you wanted to go in a different direction? Can you speak, look, can you speak to that at all? Some, some episodes just don't turn out quite the way you hoped. Okay. You know, some uh, characters don't kind of pop the way you you might think they would and um it just look uh i guess when i compare i would i would i would say compare it to other situations on the show where you can see something that really came alive and it's really no knock against sam uh or 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 anyone who was involved in the in the episode Mm -hmm. it just it didn't it just didn't work as well i mean i know fans liked it and mm-hmm. and and you know uh i'm glad they did we just didn't feel it was as successful as it could have been and i'll tell you that you know that that the dna of that character and the the sort of idea behind it we tried again and 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 the next time we tried it it was a lot more successful with vala I was about to say Val Maldoran. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean that was the. It was like that was the next. Like, are we going to try this again? And and you know, I think making it a, a female character and then, uh, you know, Claudia Black just brought something to the role that was special. And and when that happens, you're like, yeah, that's that's something that will. At be additive and bring life to the series, and you know there was something wrong with Dead Man Switch. It was a fine episode, and we had other guest characters who kind of came in for one or two episodes and were very, you know, very very good. It just to to kind of become a part of the series in a meaningful way, you kind of needed to see that real spark and something special, which you got in immediately. Valley, you're like, oh my god, that's there's like a force of nature at work here. So that's certainly uh, true. <laughs> anyway, I would just, I would sort of, that's that's the bar that I think something needs to to kind of clear in order for it, you know, in order for us to feel like it's worth uh, pursuing. Mm. The devil, you know, um, is the second part of uh, a two-parter starting with Jolinar's Memories, Mm -hmm. which gave birth to GateWorld.net. That twist at the end. uh, From this day forward, you will call me by my true name, Apophis. And we knew that Sokar had taken Apophis and had assumed that he tortured him and then did away with him. But Sokar had other plans, and you guys hid him so well that I remember watching on uh, the Showtime first airing and just going, Wah! you know, I mean, it was kind of like that. It was like, this is this is a great twist. And well, at this point, you can really tell the show is clicking on its mythology. They are they are uh, honoring previous viewers and just you guys are just rolling in it. It's great. When we talk about the show, uh, we often I will talk about the show as being you know much more of an episodic series, right? The original show, and yet you know when you, when you mentioned you wanted to talk about this episode i went back and just reread a a, a synopsis of it so i could be a little more <laughs> a little more informed but i was like this is some really complicated soapy mythology like you <laughs> you if you just watch that episode cold like i'm going to drop into a a sg1 episode and just want to want to go to a planet get into trouble get out of it and come home story it was like you'd be like what is going on like i don't i don't i don't i don't understand anything that's happening in this episode like all those payoffs were because you had lived through five years and a hundred episodes or more of you know story about apophis and story that about the team so 
you know, the, and the Tokra and, and, and Sam's you know, dad and Charlie and, and all, yeah. And, mm -hmm. You know, Martouf and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So yeah. that was some heavy serialized uh, stuff. And, and it was like, we didn't, we certainly didn't do that every episode, but when we did, it was very, um, it was very deep uh, into the <laughs> mythology for sure. When you have the, the, the significant two-parters, and the season finales. I think it is relevant to take stock of the growth of these characters and the mythology that you have laid down, not just mythology for mythology's sake, but how it impacted the people that we love to watch. And that's what you're doing here. And, you know, I mean, you, you take the devil, you know, just by itself, you know, you've, you're right. You know, you walk into it cold. I wouldn't dare give this to a, to a, a newcomer Stargate fan. I would start well, the them off on window thing, of opportunity or ergo. Well, then the crazy thing is that was pitched by it. Basically the, the two parter was pitched by uh, some, some, some writers who were just, um, you know, not, not staff writers, essentially, you know, we used to take pitches uh, back in the day from, from, uh, from writers who would just, you know, want to do what, basically being submitted to write one-off episodes. Yes. Yeah, Sonny Wareham and Daniel Stashauer did part right, one. Right. Did part one, John and memories. And, and uh, you know, their pitch was basically, you know, we go to a hell planet. <laughs> okay. I mean, that was, that was the germ of the idea, you know? Uh, and we were like, uh, yeah, we hadn't really done that look and feel before. Um, I don't know that we, we were like, we don't, we don't literally want to explore hell as a, as a, you know, religious mythological mm -hmm. place, but, but we did want to sort of take the, just the look and feel, you know, the fiery mm -hmm. kind of depths of underground and, um, and, and, and also kind of deal a little bit more with, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of SG one is, as prisoners of war and, and, uh, uh, you know, what people are willing to do to get information and, 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 and set it in a, in a kind of, uh, um, hellish, you know, aesthetic. Can you hold, I have something from this episode that I, now that you've, you started down this road, bringing up the art, can you hold for 30 seconds? Yeah. I'll be right back. Okay. So re regarding the art, I'm not sure which piece that you have, but we can certainly compare. This is um, an original okay. of Natu. And it is, Heron is credited off to the side here. Huh. Um, but Yes, you're right. So this element and this element were added, uh, in imposed on this. I think that's like, they're like glued on. But then everything else here is a pencil sketch. And it is one of the coolest uh, things in my collection. This was not cheap. Huh. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. But it's just remarkable. The craftsmanship that you guys had and the talent of these artists in creating yeah. this content. That was a spectacular uh, piece of uh, art direction. Absolutely it was. And it fit into the mythology at the time because arguably Sokar was the big bat. At that point, especially um, with Apophis being taken by him in um, Serpent Song. And then, so this this threat is like murkying about uh, early on in, in season three. David Palfi did a hell of a job uh, playing that character for the couple, three scenes that he was in. And then you, you do the unexpected and you wipe him out as we're just getting used to him. Was, was that a uh, the audience won't expect this kind of approach or was it like ah we're done with this character let's move on because that's what happened it was about building up resurrected apophis okay so it was like how do we how do we make resurrected apophis really cool well first you create someone who's really super cool and powerful and then you have apophis take him out like it was sort of it was sort of like a you know if he can if he can beat sokar then he's you know, even more awesome. So, and he absorbs his army uh, and mm -hmm. becomes a genuine threat from from season three to season four. Yeah. 
Yeah. I wish that uh, Peter Williams' character had been used more in those uh, later seasons there because he, he would show up with, with his army. For instance, uh, there was an episode called the episode called the serpent's venom, uh, which fe- featured Teal being tortured heavily and being prepared kind of like as a, as a gift, almost as like a dish to a, Ap- to Apophis in exchange for an alliance between him and Harry. He blows Harry Ro to hell. Um, and then later, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but, and then, you know, he loses his fleet at the end of season four. And I always just felt like I, I just would have liked, loved a, a, an Apophis heavy episode in, in season four to really sink our teeth into because the character was so good and he was working on a number of different levels. Apophis, you know, always had this sort of kind of, uh, up here you know he was like he was like the um aristocrat of ghouls you know he always had airs on and <laughs> yes. had a very you know, properness to him and as a result i found him to be a bit uh he didn't have a lot of great character moments you mm. know what i mean like he was good as a as a baddie and and had you know a lot of sort of power and and um you know, again, we kind of beat him down too many times to the point where he sort of lost his, uh, you know, his punch. But, but uh, I mean, I always found like the the Gould who had more human-like personalities mm-hmm. were were easier to write for. You know, like Ball was like a little more fun. You know, um, yeah, you're right. If we had ever thought to do an episode where you kind of saw the more human side of Apophis come out uh and by human i don't mean like that he wasn't a ghoul but that he was uh he just had a little more personality right Mm -hmm. uh he always felt like you know the the politician as opposed to that's true the uh the real human that's true and cliff simon also you know uh brought out those those qualities of of ball uh brilliantly by showing that that the character understood humanity in a way that none of the other gold ever really did i mean he right. he lived among us and he got us he's like you know if 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 you give these people your loving kindness they'll just they'll just eat it all up and they'll never know that you're subjugating them at all even though you are they'll never have any idea right so <laughs> maternal instinct we've talked about this in terms of the ancients um, when you went into this, was it to create um, a more uh, spiritual, abstract episode to make us to give Daniel a reason to um, explore his 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 inner Buddha? What was what was kind of like the the crux of this one? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, we often would just look at. Oh, this wasn't necessarily the the impetus for the show, but we would we would look at in the same way that we kind of borrowed from history uh, mm. and mythology for gods and uh, cultures and worlds and you know different skins essentially for the show, like different mm-hmm. different episodes which would take on different kind of uh, feelings. Um, we had not really done one that felt. You know, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of akin to Buddhism mm-hmm. um, uh, and meditation and the power of that. And 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 I I I've always sort of admired that um, the spirituality that that is kind of associated with that. And and I and I also felt like it was the groundwork for the concept of ascension. Right? It was the groundwork Correct. for for how we as human beings could evolve beyond what we are now and that and that you know the key to understanding the secret of uh, ascension was inside us you know and that came through meditation came through understanding and and uh self-control and so that was the groundwork of that sort of whole idea and and um and then i also loved the personal story you know the connection to uh 
Share through through uh, Shifu, you know, where you know there was a legacy uh, of emotion there um, and and loss that uh, Daniel was going through, which is which is great. It was more than a mission to him, right? It was personal, and um, uh, and then you also had, you know, the great uh, Terry Chen, Braytac. Oh, uh, Braytac. Yeah, like the, just the because Braytac to me always had, like he was he always had that sort of Buddhist wisdom about him. Mm-hmm. You know, he had a sort of experience and peace, and and uh, um, you know he was a warrior too, but he was he was wise in the way that it felt different than um, other Jaffa. So, I, I mean, that episode just has so many elements that I. Uh, I really loved, uh, including the sort of essentially introduction of of the uh, the ancients from Oma de Sala. Hmm. Yeah, Terry Chen and uh, Tony Amendola have a great exchange in that episode where where um, uh, uh, Braytek expresses, you know, uh, a desire to go in this direction because this is a place that the the Jaffa have been seeing. This is legend to them. And the monk tells them, you know, if you're ready to walk down this road, you're going to have to leave the symbiote behind. You cannot, you cannot approach this with, with such pure evil and um, in, in your possession. And I think one of the, the great lines from that episode is uh, the brain text says, you know, I'm not ready to die, but I'm confident. Uh, I'm, I, I take solace in the fact that that journey lies ahead of me. So it's like, you know, this is. Yeah. I mean, talking about the, the, we are, the whole sort of, um, you know, the conflict of, of who the Jaffa were, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the carriers of evil, you know, and, and, and people who had been uh, enslaved by them. And, and the fact that, you know, they then, the symbiotic relationship was such that they, they couldn't abandon it uh, without dying it was so rich and, and, and cool to, to write about. Um, yeah. I mean, he, you know, uh, anyway, like I said, the, 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 the sort of finding oneself being true to yourself and, and sort of coming to an understanding of who and what you are was always a, an interesting, you know, path to kind of walk down. So I think it's safe to say that you didn't expect the, uh, the ascension and greater opening up of the universe angle to be utilized as much over the rest of the franchise as when you, when you started it, it's really is like, is like a 90 degree turn that, that basically throws the series into warp speed in terms of the direction of the ancients and everything else that we're going to explore. From the time I started on the show, I was always uh, intrigued by the mystery of who, created the stargates Mm -hmm. like that that was a question that was always hanging over the show Mm -hmm. that i was always in my mind trying to answer and um you know it just seemed to me like we had to start figuring that out at some point absolutely you know it's just one of the greater mysteries of the fran i think i think that you would have been uh I can't imagine SG-1 without uh, the origin of that technology because the technology is what the what the via, what motivates the entire series. So we would have we would have wanted to know, you know, who they were and I think it's I think it's clever that it's it's a previous generation of us which suggests yeah, that we have unlimited that potential. Yeah, it wasn't the gold. They were parasites that just kind of were were, you know, usurping the technology and taking advantage of it and that it was something very, very old and very, very powerful and knowledgeable. Um, but I just, you know, just to me, we had to start figuring that out. But I, but I was also very cognizant. We were all very cognizant of the fact that we had made mistakes before about introducing uh, races and beings that were super powerful. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want to go down that road again of just finding you know discovering something that could solve all our problems Mm -hmm. you know you almost want that thing to be 
a problem in and of itself. Uh, so that so that it's a mis- it's a mystery to solve, not not the ultimate solution. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of why it it then started to kind of unfold as as, as slowly as it did. And it's an interesting approach to the the solution of having uh, extremely powerful beings, uh, but not having them uh, help you really in any meaningful way. And that's which comes to like full reveal in episodes like Threads, where it's like they exist, they're out there, but you're just so insignificant as to not even matter to them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the idea was. We, you know, all our problems are are very, very, very minor compared to uh, where everything is and is going in, in the vast universe. And, and um, that was another thing that I always was sort of amused by is like not to diminish the drama of the show or the stakes for the characters. But at the same time, it's like maybe we should just kind of, you know get over ourselves a little bit. <laughs> let's take stock of what we have and then examine what's going on over here season four jonathan glassner left the show um we recent we recently had him on he had he said he had a lot going on uh uh in his life there were other things that he had to address so he actually left canada uh and returned to and, and, the united and states regrets it, and regrets it ever since does he yeah he does. Oh, we haven't oh, yeah. had that conversation yet. Oh yeah, you got to him and, and we we've stayed friends over the years. Oh great. He was actually just here uh in uh well he was in Vancouver uh recently and uh yeah, I mean he always talks about wanting to you know I don't, I don't know if I believe him 100% because he hasn't done it, but he always talks about wanting to move to 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 Vancouver to Canada. Hey, there you go. The show um with Jonathan's departure, you introduce um, new staff writers, Joseph Malazzi and Paul Mully. Uh They bring out great episodes like like Window of Opportunity and Scorched Earth, which uh, with Not Joseph. Sure the fans will know who Joseph is, uh, just in case they don't. He has a blog and he's on Twitter. Occasionally he's on your show, I Occasionally. believe. Occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the changing of the guard. Tell us about saying goodbye. To, what first of all, before we get to Joe and, and Paul, um, what were the kind of of challenges that uh, you knew you were going to face uh, in season four uh, with with Jonathan not uh, being involved, or was it just simply a matter of you know that th- we we have a great infrastructure here, you know you've you've set us off on a great path. We're going to bring in a couple more people and just keep on going. Thank you so much, truly. Well, I know I got a bigger office. That was fun. Hey, bigger yeah. office. Um, yeah, I, I'm John. I'm sure John was uh, wondering, you know, wh- what I was always doing in his office with a measuring tape. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know. W- Look, we we just had to keep making a show, and uh-huh. and we needed more bodies. You know, we needed more bodies to do that. Um, like from the very get go, when I read uh, Joe and Paul's stuff, I was like, these guys are great. And then they, you know, they pitched. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the episode, but uh, information. Give me some information on it. Oh, their first episode. Well, the, um, if you could fill in the details of what was happening. Oh, I could tell yeah. You the it was, name. It was a, uh, was a, there was an alien who, there was an alien in it, David. Okay. Uh, does that That's, narrow it down uh, for you? Slightly. Um, <laughs> Scorched Earth is the episode that they wrote. Um, they wrote that one on uh, essentially as uh, 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 outside writers. So okay. typically what we would do is, uh, you know, we had a number of people pitch uh, pitch us to write, um, you know, episodes, uh, not on staff and, uh, but, you know, in, in looking for staff, when we got a good outline or something, we would, we would, you know, consider, consider bringing people on and, and, uh, Joe and Paul were always people we were thinking about, um, Mm. 
to bring on. But when they had written, they wrote their outline, we're like, oh, that's that's pretty good. Uh, and then they wrote their the script. We're like, oh, that's that's you know that's great. So uh, we knew um, that. Uh, uh, I don't think we knew they were going to contribute quite to the incredible extent that they did, but uh, it was very, it was very obvious early on that uh, they were going to be a big part of the show. I remember uh, Joe telling us about um, window of opportunity and how the original idea of it was very different where uh, they, uh, the team comes to a planet and a people who are stuck in this loop. And you had made the, um, the, gave the note and said, you know, this really should be about, about our people. This should be about us. And the treatment for this, the episode was much darker than it would originally was and became, you know, one of the classic episodes of the series that's regularly in the top five of the franchise, if not, if not greater. Yeah, I know. Uh, Joe, every once in a while, runs a poll just to confirm. Yes. Uh, his episode is the best episode that's ever been made. Um, I, 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 I don't, I'm not going to go so far as to question the validity of those polls and whether or not, uh, but you have to consider who's running them. Uh, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say, you look at the source. It's not who votes, it's who counts the votes, right? That's right. That's oh, right. God. That's right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, I don't think of that note as being, you know, revolutionary or, or, you know, uh, brilliant. It was just that, that, that was it was a, an ongoing um, concern with the show is that you could, you could always get a little over involved mm. in the guest star or the guest mm. planet of the week and realize that, um, you know, what are the stakes for us? What are the stakes for our team? And, and um, it just seemed like such a great opportunity to put our characters in in a, uh, uh, a wacky situation. Um, and that's kind of where it all, you know, it always started for us too. It's like a lot of times you'd be like, okay, so we have this concept for a planet or this mythology we're going to uh, mine, but really what is the, what is the story for, mm-hmm. for SG-1 and, and how is that uh, gonna play out, you know? Like I, I, you'd often, you know, come in and and have uh, uh, someone pitch. uh, Well, for example, you could have somebody come in and pitch, well, two characters swap bodies, but it, or O'Neill swaps body with an alien. But how much better is it when you come in and pitch Teal'c and O'Neill switch bodies? You know, suddenly you're excited about seeing that, right? Like, you know, so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is it wasn't, it wasn't that note necessarily that, that made the episode, the execution uh, of it and, and how, how it ended up coming to be, uh, you know, was, was, was really, really well done. You have, um, it, it all comes down to, to casting in the beginning of the series and executing uh, a, a show with the right talent that you know will be able to be flexible and flexible in pretty much any kind of genre of an episode that you throw at them, uh, and you're we we tune in to watch them and to see them respond to weird situations, amazing situations, funny, terrifying, sad. Uh, and you know, you, it's the kaleidoscope of range that you get over these, these, uh, seasons of programming with these core characters that make it fun to watch, you know, and the Stargate and the circumstances are just a vehicle for those characters. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I often get, uh, I'm often amused by, um, seeing those episodes, you know, mentioned in in like uh best groundhog day uh <laughs> episode of television and like, <laughs> that's right you realize how many there have been like it's like so many shows do it and uh and and movies now it's like um it's almost like groundhog day is a genre unto itself uh as is you know time travel you know like it's like I see. I'm like, oh my god, another time travel thing. It's like, haven't we 
have we done that enough? But I mean, uh, there's new audiences, right? Like That's I'm sure, true. I'm sure kids have have no idea that we did, you know, what twenty or thirty time travel stories. And it's not uh, just the new audiences. If you're taking, if you're approaching it with a fresh take, you know, then then why not? So right. there's there's always there's always room for more. And plus, how many story ideas are there out there? And what's that legend? There's only nine stories or something. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Watergate uh, was one of these outrageous episodes where it's like, let's let's create a non-corporeal uh, adversary. Uh, almost like the antithesis of what would what would later be the ancients, except in a in a much more localized form. You have a great performance in uh, Marina Sirtis, um, because you know she plays a, a a Russian character. I believe that was her first Russian character ever, hmm. uh, and uh, a great excuse to to sink a Stargate and take us to a, an aquatic planet. Some great yeah. visuals in that. Yeah, I mean, look, I was again. Uh, you know, my inspirations are are uh, pretty obvious. Um, uh, you can tell the things that I grew up on and that I loved. Uh, uh, the Abyss, obviously. Mm -hmm. Cameron's The Abyss and Leviathan, and that whole sort of series of movies of, you know, people in underwater uh, vehicles um, encountering aliens. I love that. Uh, awesome. Um, and the the uh, there was a sort of you know we've talked about this before too uh, that we would often um, because we were on TV for so long mm -hmm. we we kind of grew up with visual effects too and so as visual effects became more advanced we could do new things and that, I remember that being like water was always a tough one you know for a long time and then you know it got a little better and and we started to sort of realize because even what you would see first in the movies because they had so much more money right and then you'd go back to our visual effects guys and say well can't we do what they did in the movie and they're like no no, no that's super expensive yes but it's going to cost uh, you <laughs> yeah. super expensive and we just don't have the we can't do it as well as they can and, and so then you know you'd get to a place in that kind of timeline where mm. suddenly they'd be like, okay, now we can do it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you'd be able to sort of explore that sort of stuff. But I also loved the, um, the expanding world of the sort of the, the, the Russian Stargate program. I mean, that was uh, a lot of fun and it, 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 there was always an international quality uh, to uh, Stargate program, but it was still the air force. It was still America. It was still, you know, predominantly American run. And, and uh, as much as we explored the galaxy uh, and other planets, I think we had not really uh, so much played with all the things we could play with on, on earth. You know, um, I always loved the, the sort of the Senator Kinsey mm -hmm. episodes. Uh, Ronnie Cox was amazing. Um, and uh, the idea that there was a competing uh, Stargate program in another country on Earth was, I just thought, kind of cool. It was a terrific idea. Was this an accident? Is this because Thor's ship crashed into the Pacific with a Stargate on board? Or was that the reason for setting that up in the end of Season 3? Oh, no. Do you don't, give us, don't give us that much credit. I mean... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we could... You know, but but I think... The credit we deserve is recognizing when those threads were there, you know, like that, that we had those opportunities. I mean, there were times when we would set stuff up, like for sure, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, going back to maternal instinct, I did always have that inkling of, of, of seeding in the, the ancient story, but, um, but there were a lot, so many other times when we'd be just like, Hey, remember when that happened, mm -hmm. couldn't we do something with that? Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't think it was always, uh, uh, you know, a mad genius as so much as, uh, frankly, desperately searching for stories. Um, and, it didn't come uh, off of that way. Yeah. And then realizing, uh, we had 
you know, left a whole bunch of um, Easter eggs of our own in, in the show, you know, and so we just had to play off those. Excavate them from the ocean floor, no less. Yeah, exactly. So this is a great uh, a turning point for Tom Macbeth's character, Mayborn. Um, he's gone full Russian. What a journey he had, right? Man, oh man! You know, this was his pivot point. This was like the like the the well, the next episode when we find him behind bars. That's his lowest point. Don't get me wrong, but this is the kind of the the start off the start of that with uh, uh, him being um, well, holy, holy frozen bad guys was was yes. uh, uh, Rick's comment as Jack, uh, and Tom told us about how he had like had thought he had burnt his 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 corneas uh laying under the under the heat lamp for so long uh but it turns into a wonderful um uh, buddy relationship over the next next couple of seasons this this pivot of him going dark side uh and then turning around and suddenly discovering his inner humanity right yeah, I, I I can't remember exactly where Paradise Lost fell in that season in six, that, season six into that uh, sort of timeline. But I I, I quite like that episode. I remember uh, Rick and, and uh, Tom had a great time. Absolutely, we have one of my favorites, absolute power, uh, tour de force for Michael. Um, this is a great episode that brings back Shifu and he's basically he has his own agenda in this really he shows up on Abydos we have a, the great return of Eric Avari who we didn't nearly get to see nearly enough uh his schedule was always conflicting um so he says and uh the, the Shifu just really basically wanted to get to know uh his mother and so he uses Daniel as a vehicle to do that and we see a future that might have been. You kind of take us down this road where it's like, especially now, thinking about the episodes, like, whoa, we we go there. Um, tell us about Absolute Power. This is going to sound like I'm criticizing the episode. Okay. It, it is more, today, looking back, it feels a bit more like a trope. You know, like, mm -hmm. it is really one of those sci-fi uh, tropes where you, um, you know, it's like you don't want you don't want the thing you think you want mm. uh, or it's more it's more you know the power is 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 dangerous i mean um that's the lesson mm -hmm. you know uh i i i think again i was probably being inspired a little bit by uh by um war games you know the, mm -hmm. the matthew broderick movie um it's like if you create it uh, or if it's there or if you discover it maybe someone's going to use it um and uh and you know putting characters in situations that they are not it is makes you know it's out of character for them is always you know interesting drama and so to take daniel who is the most sort of i guess you would you'd feel like he's the the more sort of socially conscious peace-loving guy the guy pacifist. who's always pacifist yeah trying to kind of um use knowledge and use uh his his uh uh negotiating skills and whatever to you know jack was the kind of you know shoot first ask questions later kind of guy and and um so to put daniel in this situation where it's like i'm gonna i'm the one who's who's gonna be able to handle this and see him go that far is uh i guess what made it um you know a story worth telling or or more interesting uh but uh but yeah you know you always have to sort of um again it, it, it's i think it would be like it would almost like this whole this whole uh conversation we've had in a way is thematically goes back to that uh you know tempering of of super powerful things right mm -hmm. it's like the 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 quest for super powerful things and and whether or not we're going to get them and if we get them what are the consequences of that and what are the dangers of that so and you know along the way you know instead of diminishing the super powerful thing 
I guess it was interesting to ask the question, what if you don't really want the super powerful thing? <laughs> what well, would be better if no one ever invented the nuclear bomb? Right, right exactly. And I, my uh, love of a lot of what this genre uh, brings about is that you can have your cake and eat it too. You want to see what it would be like for Earth to be full power, fully, you know, powered and and, and uh, have all the defenses that you can possibly imagine? Well, we'll show you. You know, it turns into some place that you don't necessarily want to be. Uh, and so we get to see uh, the characters walk down paths um, that we never would have necessarily thought that they would be capable of. And then we get to safely walk them back, which sometimes can be irritating. It's like, okay, you know, but in this, in this, uh, you, you were but really, I, guess what I'm, I feel like my, no, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're fine. But I, feel like, I feel like the, maybe I'm, I'm, you know, looking back at it through the lens of today, but I feel like audiences are so sophisticated now that, that, you know, they would see that coming in that episode if you showed it. To, like, I mean, there's something nostalgic about it. And again, seeing Daniel go down that road was interesting then. But um, I don't, I personally, now, if I was going to write an episode like that, I would, I think I would try and find something a little more sophisticated, hopefully, to say at the That's end fair. so that it was worthwhile as opposed to just pulling the rug out from under you at the end right that's fair like, it, was I, all, it was all a dream you know well okay i'm a and this is just speaking from me here i'm an enormous trekkie while i watched this show i was watching star trek voyager at the same time because you guys were running at the same time mm -hmm. this was remember, this was my weekly episodes. there were a few episodes that were a little similar yeah you know apophis's you know piece you know after he comes back seven of nine kind of thing um little things like that pop up but my frustration with voyager is the unhappening you have year of hell which is a great two-parter they don't remember it at all. You have Course Oblivion, which is a duplicate of Voyager. They never encounter these people. With your stories, with Unending, where where Teal'c, it's reversed. Teal'c remembers and is and has that knowledge moving forward. Does it amount to so much? Not. I mean, that's a question. With absolute power, Daniel remembers the lesson. He he remembers what has has happened to him and what has transpired. So if, uh, you, we can debate uh, uh, changing the certain elements of the story to be less trivial or whatever you want to put. But at least these lessons are lessons that carried the individuals and the team forward. They weren't right. blank slate wiped out. Right, right. No, and, and I, again, I'm not not trashing the episode i'm just saying that, <laughs> okay. uh, i'm just saying that i feel like um looking back now it feels like a bit of a trope and mm. and that i also you know i'm wary of uh stories that are you know kind of pulling the wool over your eyes yeah. when in fact i think you know now if you look back if you were in uh, uh, watching an episode like that you'd be like well, this isn't real. This can't be real. Um, uh, so what are they okay. trying to say? Okay. And and so there's value in that. But just just that, oh, you know, having too much power is dangerous. It's like. It's a pretty obvious thing to say, and I guess I guess there's. Um, uh, you know, there's entertainment value in watching Daniel go down that that road and Michael's performance is terrific, but. Um, but yeah, and that's my. That's my self-critical two cents that's, worth. That's I fair. Would, I, I, I would probably do it differently if I was doing it again today. That's fair. It's it's it, it 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 just is. It's the episode I think speaks to the fact that we have spent so much time hearing from the people above us. When are we ever going to get anything uh, uh, worthwhile uh, in terms of military hardware coming back through that gate? And you give it to us with this episode, and afterwards but we we sufficiently move on. So I think it's I think it's a I think it's a right. great show. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. <I'll take> that. <laughs> All right. Double Jeopardy. Uh the one episode directed by Michael. And 
we have the return. I was like, you, oh, you want to direct an episode? All right, great, great. <laughs> Here you go. Here's the hardest episode to direct ever. <laughs> what if you didn't direct one after that? It was like, I learned my lesson. I get it. Oh man, with this, with the split screen and and everything else, that was just. Uh, but it was it was cool to see his head blown off nearly at the beginning of that. And and what a good shot that was. You know, visual effects wise, that was really well done. Again, when you talk about tropes, I mean, you know, you walk in and you go, hey, duplicates. And, and everybody's <laughs> like, oh, well, it's really? better than evil twin brother. Really? We're going to do duplicates again? Um, but, <laughs> but then you, you know, the, the it's like, wait a sec. What if? And, you know, and then you, the, the, you know, Daniel gets, and, and again, it's like, so Daniel gets killed again. Uh, <laughs> but this time, uh, anyway, you, 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 your point, the point is um, <laughs> in science fiction, yeah, you're going to do body switcheroos and duplicates and robots and time travel and, uh, uh, you know, time loops. But what what is it what's the value in this episode what is the reason for doing this uh and um and i thought that episode was uh was quite a bit of of fun i mean just just the the simple idea of all those robots we met once actually didn't you know bury the gate and we're right we're out we're doing doing missions like rescuing people and and (laughs) and and you know that that was a fun idea, right? That was it. It elevated the "let's do duplicates again" uh, trope to something kind of special, you know, something that was worth doing. And I think, look, we had those arguments all the time, and particularly later on in the as the series wore on, you know, you couldn't help but return to things, to concepts you had done before, and um, but there was still. There had to be some mythology related or character related element to it mm. that made it worth doing. Well, Jay Brazo returning as Harlan, uh, one of my favorite yeah. guest performances in the entire friggin' franchise. Yeah, and that was the I other I loved that character. It's like, but we get to have Jay back again. And and it was like, okay. Come try ya. <laughs> Absolutely. I would so, yeah, I mean, Michael Michael did a great job. Um, it was, uh, hard on him. I mean, you, you, you know, uh, everybody I'm sure understood the, well, Daniel's off on another planet, uh, uh, right. story in the- <laughs> that's not that hard to do. There's excavations um, happening all the time. I'm sure. Right. Right. So he, he was, uh, <laughs> he was indisposed, uh, on, uh, on the, uh, Tahiti planet. Um, <laughs> And uh, having a good time while while Michael Shanks was was uh, was directing. I mean, directing and acting is hard enough. Directing and, and acting two characters would have been like completely uh, impossible. Not, not did you write this episode knowing that Michael was going to direct it so that you could write Daniel out, or did it require rewrites when it was like, ooh, he's getting you know, this I one? Don't, I think the writing him out was happened after we decided Michael was going to direct that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is, uh, this is essentially part one of a three parter. If you, if you include the Gould mothership, because it's setting up the finale is what you're doing with this. Right. You're, you're dealing with Cronus, the, the Jaffa, uh, revenge arc from, uh, this season. There were a couple of elements going on. This one was going back to season three. And then, um, we deal with in the next episode, the Jaffa revenge arc with Tanith. Um, but it was great in that Tilk kind of gets his revenge, but he kind of doesn't because he yeah. doesn't get the one to do it. His yeah, robot, robot duplicate, does. right? I know. That always comes down to like you know who are we? Are you uh-huh. know, uh huh? Is how close to Tilk is the robot? And I, I think that's fun. Well, I mean, we've had the conversation about point of view. Ours is the only reality of circumstance of consequence. So, and you wanted to steer yeah. kind of away from that to make it more about our people and how what we're watching is relevant. It does matter. I mean, look, at the end of the day, revenge is is not all that satisfying, and and it just you know, it just also kind of it messes up your soul. So why why right. bother? 
Well, absolutely. <laughs> Gosh. Better to forgive. Rob, um, it's, uh, it's a trip going back through these and, and talk with you. I want to, to get into... Uh... Yeah, it was a trip for me, too. I had to go back and, <laughs> and uh, refresh my memory and, and go down, uh, you know, uh, mythology lane. Uh, Exercise that gray matter. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but it's always a blast, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping there will be uh, some exciting news. But look, the, the, these things take time. You know, it's not as simple as mm -hmm. pushing a, a button and now Amazon, you know, controls everything. It's like right. there's going to be some, some, you know, restructuring and all that sort of stuff. And uh, we'll see what happens. I'm hopeful. So, and I hope that your days involved in this franchise are not completed. I'm hoping at some point in the future that uh, you will uh, have some involvement in, in whatever comes next yeah, in, in the next few years. Me too. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. So, take care. My thanks so much to Rob for joining us once again for another episode of Dial the Gate. You know, he thinks he doesn't have memories, but they're they're in there. There's some pretty cool memories of working on this show. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. And if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We now offer t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com slash merch. Or you can just uh, also go to the main website, dialthegate.com, and click on the merchandise tab. You can check out a specific design to see what items are being offered. Checkout is fast and easy, and you can use a credit card or PayPal. Just visit dialthegate.com slash merch. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We have another one coming up in just a moment here. My thanks to my producer, Linda Gategabber Fury, as well as my moderating team, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy Reese, and Anthony. These are the people who make the show possible. My thanks to Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web. He's our web developer on Dial the Gate. And also to Jeremy Heiner, our webmaster who keeps the site up to date. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. Thank you again for joining us. I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>